Hello, Lafayette, and welcome to episode two of the L Pi podcast, where we talk about Lafayette schools, the L Pi Education Foundation, and what your donation supports for our teachers and children. My name is Adam Welcome. I am the host of this podcast for L Pi and also a father of two children currently at Spring Hill Elementary. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today on the show, we are so excited to welcome the Kirsten Jensen Horn as our guest. Kirsten is a Burton Valley mother, wedding coordinator, runner, L Pi art teacher, and in junior high school, she had drawings and paintings exhibited at national exhibitions. Oh my gosh. Kirsten, welcome to the podcast. And you can you please introduce yourself? Well, that was quite the introduction, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do it in El Pi. We go big. You go big, apparently. <laughs> um, no, I'm glad to be here and glad to talk about El Pi art. I have taught kindergarten art at Burton Valley and Spring Hill. This would have been my fourth year. Um, we are in COVID land, so art is rolling out a little bit differently this year, but I'm also responsible for putting together the program and, and running it, and it's a really interesting challenge, and I'm super glad to be here and, and enthusiastic about it. So what would you like to know about El Pi Art? Oh my God, we have so many questions. I could talk about wedding coordinating and running and... <laughs> your national exhibitions. That is for another podcast, Kirsten. Yeah. Hopefully we can have you on again down the road. But I think the first question that I have is, if you had to choose one lesson, what is your favorite art lesson to do with kids? Kirsten, if you had to pick one lesson that you do with your kindergarten students, which lesson would it be? Okay, I love actually the first and second lessons that we do with the kindergarten students. We call them mixed up creatures. And the first lesson is based on line because we're starting the year be crucial to art. Um, we have them use a fork, a two inch wide brush, a narrow brush that's like a half an inch and a Q-tip. And with each different implements, they make lines on paper with paint. So we have them brainstorm types of lines, straight lines, Lines, wave lines. Um, the kindergartners invented the castle line, which is exactly what you would think looks like the up and down of the top of a castle building wall. Um, swirly lines, anything you can think of. And we encourage them not to just scribble lines, but to make intentional lines that overlap each other. So they're creating essentially colored paper with lots and they all have different colors of paint and then the second week we come back with the dry paper that they've made and we cut it into different shapes so we talk about organic shapes that occur in nature and geometric shapes like from math and science and they put these shapes together to create this mixed up creature and the mixed up creatures can be anything I often end up with something that looks a little bit like a dinosaur turned unicorn with um, scales or something. We encourage them to make <laughs> yeah. sure that they have an eye in the middle of the head or two eyes or three eyes um, so that it obviously looks like an animal. And then at the very end, they put what types of animals, it's like it's a mixed up frog, snake, dragon or whatever it is and they name it, so whatever name they want. And we write that on the art. And it's just really cool because everybody's successful and everybody does something really different. Some kids will work really tiny, some take up the whole thing, spines on their creature. It's, it's just really fun. And you see their creativity come out. And for a beginning of art lesson at the beginning of the year, it's really neat to see them all and happy and pleased. Well, I love what you said about everyone takes their art in a different way. I know as, a, as an educator myself, I've seen many 
art lessons over the years and I've always had a problem with that cookie cutter art like on the wall and everybody's art looks the same and I'm sure there are some benefits to just doing the art but art is an expression I think almost more importantly what you said I heard numbers I heard lines and then you said math and science my friends art is not just art art is embedded into so many different things that mm. teachers teach on a daily basis. So you come in, you do an art lesson with kindergarten students, and then three days later, that teacher can then cross pollinate what you did in that art lesson in math or social studies or science. There are just so many, so many connections uh, with the curriculum across, just across the school day. And you know, the second, this really actually leads really well into my second question. I feel like I've read so many articles and watched so many TED Talks about art and the benefit it has on the brain. Now, what are your thoughts and experiences kind of with that idea? Well, you might have actually watched more TED Talks on the subject than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it definitely has a really positive impact on the brain, especially on developing young brains. So, so art definitely uses different parts of the brain than traditional academic, you know, math, science, whatever. And so by doing art alongside stuff in a classroom, kids strengthen the connections between the different parts of the brain. That's so important for later learning. And I really feel like art gives a good foundation for that. I've actually seen that play out myself in, in kind of an unusual way, but like statistics in college. Mm. Um, I was solving problems in a completely different way than the professor was teaching them. And yet she loved what I was doing and she hadn't seen people do it before. And it wasn't common to have an art major in a statistics class. So was like, oh my gosh, this has to be the influence of that creative thinking and your own understanding of the concepts and how to reroute and find different ways to get to answers. Say that's interesting because I remember when I was a teacher in San Ramon Valley Unified and I had some students, I remember one student in general um, had uh, some challenges with just kind of, you know, sitting for prolonged periods and just some of the connections. And I remember uh, I had a parent that would come in and do art. And then that student would ask, when are we going to do more art? And as a young 22 year old, brand new teacher, I made the connection. The, this child and so many other kids just flourished because everyone has a different brain, Kirsten, and you know this, yeah. and I learned it. And I think that's where the art connections to so many different uh, things that kids do. And also as a form of therapy and play therapy and just accessing, yeah you know, different parts of our brain. And I'm sure we could talk for just hours and hours and days and days. But I, my, my third question, I would say leads into that as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been to the top of the Empire State Building. And people always say, what's your elevator pitch? And I don't think that is the most fair question because if I'm only going up two floors, I, I, need, I need more time. So if you were on the bottom floor of the Empire State Building, and you had an elevator full of people and you were going to the top, what would you tell them about your program and the benefits it has for kids? It, every child connects in different ways with art. So we teach in kindergarten 10 lessons a year and in order to see each child in the classroom connect more than once, but not with every single lesson and they get really into it. And it's like the art takes over and they're not necessarily aware of what their friends sitting next to them are doing. They're into their art. And what's interesting is that it's a different lesson for each child because kids are wired differently. They all get something out of the overall experience. And then I really believe that it teaches creative problem solving. So down the road, they're at work and they have some problem that they can't solve. Hopefully they're thinking outside the box and their brains are kind of wired to think around things. It's like in drawing, especially with kindergartners, they want to draw some creature and they have it imagined in their mind. 
but they can't execute it exactly as they can see it in their mind and they can get frustrated or sad. And so we come along and empathize with those feelings, but I also encourage them to look at that stray mark that they made as like becoming a spine or a wing or a tail or a really cool type of eyelash. You can turn this quote unquote mistake as they start out seeing it into something that's even better than what they possibly imagined. So I love seeing them stretch their brains and struggle through something and then create something that they love at the other end of it. And I think that's valuable across art all the way through school. Well, I'm smiling and I know you're smiling. Listening is smiling, just thinking back to maybe an art lesson that you did as a child in school or with your own kids and you were dirty and you had paint on your hands and your brain was just being, you know, talking from a runner to a runner, you're exercising your brain in yeah. different ways, which is just, is so important. So now I'm going to ask the question that I think a lot of people in Lafayette are thinking about. What does art look like during distance learning? It's this is unprecedented. Everybody in 2020 is a brand new teacher. Every principal is a brand new principal. Every LPI art teacher is a brand new LPI art teacher. What does it look like? What changes? I mean, just kind of give it to us, Kirsten. Okay, so this year, because we can't be in the classrooms, which is definitely sad for everybody for numerous reasons, but I missed it because we really like walking around and talking to the kids as they work. And we love the therapeutic experience of art as kids work. It centers them, gives them something else to focus on. Um, but that can't happen in exactly the same way this year. So we're trying to get to the next best, just like everybody else is. And there are going to be videos that roll out, 15 of them per grade and the art instructors who are normally in the classroom teaching have taken on the responsibility of making those videos. So the videos will be each one lesson long and we'll have moments in them where the instructors will say, okay, now is a good time to stop the video and finish doing whatever we just talked about and then turn it back on when you're ready for the next step. Um, in a classroom, we as instructors can kind of judge when the class is ready for the next step. Over video, we can't, but we're hoping that the kids can sort that out and use the video that way themselves. And then we're still working on it, but we're going to try and figure out a way for the kids to share their artwork with each other when they're done, because that's something that's missing not being in the classroom. And it's, it's pretty critical because the diversity in terms of experience and finished results is amazing. So the kids getting to see what the person sitting across from them or next to them did and how it's different from theirs, despite it being kind of the same basic assignment. So we're going to have some hopefully really amazing videos. And then, you know, we're also really hoping to be back in the classrooms next year. Sure. Well, the videos are going to be amazing. I'm, I'm sure of that. And I love what you said about the sharing piece of it. I know yeah. I think art is so much better. Like, I love museums and I've been through to so many museums around the world. And I'm always, I love going to a museum with somebody else. So I can say, you know, Kirsten, what do you think? And Jennifer, hey, did you all know that Jennifer Martell, the president of LPI is with us today? And I just wanted to kind of break in halfway through the podcast. Jennifer, in your work with LPI as, as president and 2020 is unprecedented with just kind of what we are dealing with and, and pivoting is, is like, I, it's my word for 2020 because we're all just kind of pivoting just the importance of, of LPI and the importance of LPI art. Do you have a few words to say about that and just continuing to fund these amazing programs that we have? Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I um, think I, I'm really excited that LPI Art is um, coming to our students in October. As a parent of a child that lives for LPI Art, um, those days at school, this is going to be amazing, and it's a great way to get it into the classroom. And it, we are so lucky in Lafayette, and I think parents don't often realize we have 
our teachers are amazing. Our art teachers come from this broad, diverse background and they bring so much into the classroom. And we're really lucky for our kids to get that experience because a lot of kids don't. Yeah, I mean, I think I said it on the last podcast, episode one with Paul Chopra, our treasurer, where we kind of really went mm-hmm. deep with the numbers and the funding. I work in, in my work as a, as a consultant in education now, I work with hundreds of school districts a, a year and I actually tell them about my personal experience and my kids and getting art and they say, you guys get art? And it's like, well, yeah, it's because we have an amazing foundation and, and parents that support. So uh, Jennifer, thanks, thanks for being on. I know it's a, this is a new endeavor we have with the podcast, but Kirsten, back to the questions. This is the <laughs> lightning round where I have some questions and we would like to know your answers. What okay. is your favorite museum that you've ever been to? Oh my gosh, that's a tough one. Um, we I ask tough with... questions here on the El Pi podcast. Yeah, saying. yeah, you're, you're just challenging me. I might nah. need more coffee. Um, I'm going to go with the Palace of the Legion of Honor, actually, in San Francisco. Wow. It's local. I have memories of being there with my husband when we were dating. So for kind of sentimental reasons. Um, memories of being there as a kid to see an Ebo show. And, you know, I've been to lots of museums. They're all amazing all around the world. Um, as a child, I loved the Victorian Albert in London. They had a nice. great miniatures collection and we lived there for a while when I was a kid and nice. a popular Saturday activity. So yeah, I'm so, going local with this one. Yeah, I was going to say, go right, when COVID's over. <laughs> I was just going to say, write it down, people. And when COVID's over, you can go. Um, I'm going to say the Van Gogh in Amsterdam is my favorite, my favorite museum. It's just, it's just, it's broad. It's amazing. And it's uh, awesome. the Vondel Park right outside, you can just hang out and spend an entire day. Uh, question number two, favorite artist or painter of all time? That's also tough. I'm going to say two. Um, I love Claude Monet, which is very kind of typical. Everybody loves his work. I actually love him because I learned a bunch about the social history period when I was in college. And to be perfectly honest, it was kind of the first time I really loved learning history. Um, I also just love the style and the colors and the changes that it brought about for art. And then a little more locally, I'm gonna go back to Wayne Thiebaud he taught at Davis when I was there studying mm-hmm. art. And so I actually got to take an upper division painting class from him. It was amazing. He is very humble. He walked around the classroom and talked to us. He did paintings with us. It was a whole semester of painting without any black or white paint. You had mm-hmm. to mix all of your own colors from the color wheel with no black or white. So it was a challenge. and. Wow. Yeah, I love him as a painter and also just personally really good person. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I see the association with Monet because I've seen many Monets and there's so much color in Monet and I don't know the backstory of of, uh, mixing, but I don't see a lot of blacks in Monets. It's just so many bright, bright colors. Am I correct on that? Sort of. It depends on which picture, which painting of his you're looking at because he painted you know, the same subject 30 times at different times of day Mm. and in different seasons. So some of those dusk paintings or really early morning paintings of a subject outside have more gray and black in them. But there are definitely similarities in terms of lots of pops of color and colors sitting next to each other that might not always appear to be next to each other. Art is not just connected to math and science, it's also connected to history. So thank you for the brief history lesson on Monet Kirsten. Next question on the lightning round, best resource for kids to do any additional art projects at home? Do you have any recommendations? That's actually a tough one for me because I am so used, you know, art is so kind of inbred in my soul. I'm so used to just seeing the collection of stuff and asking them to do things with it, and they've gotten used to it. A favorite in our family that actually works really well, and it's not a resource, but it's more of like something they could do with the kids, um, works really well when you're out, is to take a piece of paper, fold it into three or four pieces, style fold, and have one person draw the head of some whimsical beast at the top of the fold. And then the next person opens it up 
and draws another section of the body, folds it over, passes it to the next person. So nobody really knows what they're drawing. And then you open it up at the end and you've got this whimsical creature that everybody has helped create. And it's just fun to pass around and talk about what everybody's thinking as they do it. Nice. Yeah. All right, last question for the lightning round. Color crowns, markers, <laughs> or paint? Uh, fabric. Yes, <laughs> <me>. <laughs> totally. I mean, it would have it would have been watercolor for a long time, and then I switched <laughs> to fabric. And now, you know, like walking into quilting fabric stores is like going into a candy store for me. I love it. My husband's like, "Okay, I'll see you in a couple hours." <laughs> ah, that's awesome. But I do have quite a large quantity of amazing fabric, and I love putting it together in different ways. And that's where the color, you know. Bumping colors up against each other. Is That's so fun. fun. That's so fun. All right, um, Kirsten, I am a firm believer in no homework for kids other than reading. But for parents, homework is okay. What homework can you give parents in relation to El Pai Art? Like, look at last year's projects from their kids, ask their kids about a lesson, go outside, draw something. You know, just, I want to get ask is there a way to get parents more involved into what has happened to get them ready for what is going to happen come October? Um, I would say talk to them about what they've learned after a lesson of art history and then some kind of demonstration of the project and then ask the kids to create their own art. So we hope that they remember a little bit of the art history and the basic art concepts being taught. Nothing about that, it will reinforce that memory. And also, most kids are so proud of their work and delighted to show it to somebody and someone who's interested. So I think that's really important. And then at home, while we all are, you know, stuck inside with wildfires and maybe outside once things clear up um going outside and looking at nature and drawing and finding shapes if you're stuck inside and looking at the color i would i would caution parents kids can struggle so much to try and draw realistic things so encourage them to be spontaneous and less careful and less uptight about having it look perfect and more capture the feeling of it. Capture the air moving in the trees or um, be open to different ways that art expresses itself and, and encourage your kids. Well, I think what I'm gonna do, something you said about Monet painting the same portrait or picture multiple times a day, I'm going to go into the huge folder that my wife has curated from over the years uh, from my kids being at Spring Hill and all of their oh. art. And I'm going to have them maybe do one of those projects again because it's going to look different because they're older and they're in a different place. So, you know, while we are waiting for October to rapidly uh, come here, Jennifer, your children are waiting anxiously maybe maybe we do that and i think that would be a fun comparison when you were in kindergarten and now you're in fifth or when you went first and now and now you are in third and that might be a nice actually fun showcase the kind of before and after uh, anytime but i would say especially right now so i actually think that's a really fantastic idea and then i would encourage you to think about switching materials too if and we say this year if we're doing something in colored pencils and you can't find the colored pencils, use the crayons. Mm -hmm. If the original project was done in oil pastels and you don't happen to have oil pastels at home, do it in colored pencil or try it in watercolor. Those different materials and gives rise to more expressionism. Just lets the kids share what they're feeling. Kirsten Jensen Horn, once the weather clears up, we're going to have to go on a run together and talk more about art. That. It has been so absolutely amazing to have you on the podcast this morning. Everyone listening, there are so many different ways that you can listen to the LPI podcast Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, 
Spotify, you name it, please subscribe. You can go to the LPI YouTube channel. We have it all on there as well too. Everybody consumes their content in different ways. Go to lpi.org. There's an orange button right on the top of the website that says donate. Please donate, do what you can. Uh, tell your friends, it's never too late. All of these programs are possible and happening because of the generous donations that uh, everyone in Lafayette, from all the elementary schools to Stanley Middle Schools and also Akalani's High School, which mm -hmm. is part of LPI, even though it's a separate district. Uh, we are a, um, very fortunate to live where we live and thank you for all of your continued support. Kirsten, any final thoughts or comments about art before we uh, close out the podcast? No, I'm just going to echo what you've already said, but we are so lucky in Lafayette to have the parent support and the support from LPI to fund art. I really believe it's a critical part of a well-rounded education and well-rounded children's brains as they grow up. So I think for all of you, you really enjoy what we're doing and we're so grateful to LPI. Kirsten, Jennifer, thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening and have an absolutely amazing day. Thank you. Now for a special message from LPI Executive Director, Beth Goldberg. Hi everyone, and thank you for listening to the LPI podcast series. We hope you are enjoying the conversations and learning about the impact of your donations to LPI. If you wanna hear more, please subscribe. We will continue to roll out conversations with experts in our community, so you can hear firsthand how our students are benefiting from your support. Without an education foundation in Lafayette, we would lose incredible programming that expands opportunities for our students. So please visit lpi.org and donate an amount that is meaningful to you. If you have questions or hot topics you'd like us to talk about, contact LPI at office at lpi.org. Thank you and stay tuned for the next podcast.